We have come to about 1981, 1982. Um, before this time, um, as I was beginning to fit into the classroom more and more uh, uh, comfortably, the college decided that it would be important for me to continue my graduate studies and uh, that I, I needed to work toward a doctoral degree. And so at that, in, in 1979, I uh, chose to go to Andrews University to work on a THD degree, that is a Doctor of Theology degree, and uh, spend uh, a couple of years back there and uh, then write a dissertation and complete the, doctor, the requirements for a doctorate in theology. So with my family, my, my son and my wife, we packed up and we moved back to Andrews University. We got to experience the beautiful winters of Andrews University and trudging through the snow and I even broke my leg on one occasion on a bicycle. So those were kind of interesting years for us at uh, Andrews University uh, in 1979 to 1981. Now I did appreciate the classes that I was able to take and the, uh, the added knowledge that I was able to get. I didn't appreciate so much the, uh, the hoops that one had to, get, to, to jump through in order to even get to the classes. We had, I had to have a, a reading knowledge of obviously Greek and Hebrew, but also German and French uh, to pass exams in that before I could even take the first class. And so those were some of the, uh, the not so nice things in my, that I had to go through, but I did appreciate. I did appreciate the time that I was able to spend there and the classes uh, that I was able to take and the teachers at Andrews University. So that was good. But what really happened for me and what really was significant about that was not so much the classes that I was able to take because now again I was beginning to formulate my thinking on these issues of salvation and righteousness by faith. And I had come to some conclusions about Desmond Ford and I saw his, his direction as really a very dangerous direction for the future of Seventh-day Adventism. And I was putting together my thoughts and reflecting on this. I was, it was so good for me to get away from the kind of intense uh, uh, controversy that was building up at Pacific Union College and just separate it from it completely and do some thinking and do some studying. And for the first time in my life, I was exposed to what is known as the 1888 message. In all my experience in Adventism up to that point, and again I've gone through all of my education in Adventist schools from second grade on through graduate school, I had never heard anything about Jones and Wagoner. I had not heard about it, obviously, in academy, and I did not hear anything about it in my college experience as a student. I had heard virtually nothing about it. And uh, all of a sudden, I began to hear of some things that were happening. Now, there were individuals that knew of, the, of this long before I was aware of it once again. During the 1950s, uh, two individuals that uh, were former missionaries in Australia, uh, Wheeland and Short, came back to the United States. And they began reprinting some of the books of Jones and Wagoner and talking about their theology. And, uh, and some meetings were being held about uh, what the 1888 message was all about. I virtually knew none of that up until the period of about 1980. And so all of a sudden, I thought that I needed to understand what was being taught, what was this message that 1888 was really all about, and how it was significant. So I began to dig, and I began to read. And this was the most important part of my experience away from the controversy uh, and just in the, with the ability to sit down and think and read. And I began to see things that I had never really seen clearly before. Number one, their understanding of the gospel was completely different than Desmond Ford's understanding of the gospel on all levels. That sin is not necessarily an inheritance of birth, that it is a matter of decisions that we make. 
when we have understanding of what is true and what is not true. Most importantly, their focus was on Jesus Christ, uplifting Jesus Christ, but uplifting a Christ who came all the way down to our level, not skipping 4,000 years of heredity, for which there is no evidence in Scripture or in the spirit of prophecy, that he did not take a different nature than we have today, but he came in the same nature that we have the nature which is prone to selfishness and is prone to being tempted from within as well as from without, the dangerous nature of fallen humanity. And then their focus on justification was very much different than, uh, than Desmond Ford. Justification is not only a declaring righteous, but a making righteous, in which God not only declares us to be forgiven, but he changes us so we have new values, new understandings of who we are and who God is and what the, what the gospel is all about. Or else God is telling a legal fiction. I'm declaring you righteous when you are really unrighteous. The 1888 message says what God says he has already made to be true. And so that became another part of this message that uh, I had not understood before, uh, that they taught before that time. And then, of course, the conclusion of the message has to be that if God can make us righteous at the moment of justification and produce a sanctifying growth in our experience all the way down through our lifetime, there will come a time, if we live to the end of this earth's history, when all sin will have been removed by the grace and the power of God, and so we will no longer be sinning in thought or word or action which is the only definition of sin that is, that is valid. I began to understand that their gospel was a completely different gospel than the gospel of Desmond Ford. From beginning to end, from root to conclusion, that this was a, is a completely different way of seeing salvation and how God is, is preparing a people for translation at the very end of time. And so Desmond Ford's gospel began to become very clear to me as an aberration, as a false gospel, as a teaching that would destroy the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And I began to be very, very grateful for a message that came in 1888. Now there's one thing that we need to clarify there. It is called the 1888 message. But in that particular year, can we say unfortunately or maybe by God's providence, we don't know. No record was taken of the presentations they made at the 1888 conference. There are no verbatim transcripts of that. Now, later general conferences all had verbatim transcripts. They were all done, and we have the record of each one. But in that year, there was no record of what they taught. There were only eyewitness accounts of what they taught. So that means that we do not know everything they said in that particular conference. And some people say, well, that means we don't know what the 1888 message is. I think it may be providential that because that was just the beginning of their teaching on the gospel and on these issues. When they really began to formulate their opinions and state them very clearly was in the early 1890s. And in 1893 and 1895, this message came to full fruition. Uh, they began to, it began to be a very polished mes message. They began to say things as clearly as they had ever said them, and their writings were in harmony with that at that time. So it really should be called the 1890s message, the message which was designed uh, to get God's people ready for translation. Because if we read Ellen White correctly here, we were to be in a period of time at that period to prepare us for translation. There should have been a second coming in the 10 or 12 years following 1888, according to Ellen White. And this was the message which was to prepare people for translation. She said it was the beginning of the loud cry. She said that if, that if we rejected this message, we would reject Jesus Christ, the author of this message. So that began to impress me greatly during this period of time, that this is where God had spoken to us more clearly on the subject of righteousness by faith 
than at any previous time in Adventist history. And, uh, and I began to dig deeply into this period and this understanding. Just to kind of pull it all together, um, the message of 1888 and the years following is just as much in jeopardy today as it ever was in 1888. Uh, Ellen White wrote so much about the fact that, uh, that uh, if the leaders continue to oppose and ridicule the message and the messengers, their salvation could be at stake in this, issues and this issue, and there needed to be repentance. Well, today, there is just as much opposition in high scholarly circles against the messages of Jones and Wagoner, the issues of sin being a matter of choice, Jesus Christ taking our fallen nature, justification being made righteous as well as declared righteous, and complete victory over all sin before Jesus comes back to this earth. Those issues are just as much opposed today as they ever were in, eight, in the 1890s. So this message is still not accepted by and large in Adventist scholarly circles. And we're going to see as we move on through these uh, presentations how that is impacting us right now today. The 1888 message, I believe, was the clearest message ever given to the Seventh-day Adventist Church on how to get ready for translation and the second coming of Christ. I think that this is something every one of us needs to get deeply into right now. That the messages are there. When I was growing up, the books were not available. But uh, today, we have them all. And there is no reason now for us to be ignorant about the messages of, of that period of time. We can read them for ourselves. There are many presentations, both uh, uh, verbally and in written form, as to what this message was and what its essence was. And we have the tremendous advantage today that was not available to my parents and my grandparents. Uh, they did not have this message. It was buried. It was buried for decades. But now it's available to us because I believe that we are now in another period like 1880s and 1890s. We are now in a period in which I think Jesus is preparing the way for, him, for, for his coming back to this earth in this period of time. And we can be that generation. If, it, if the message was right for the, at, for the period of the 1890s, it is even more right for the period that we live in today. This, I believe, is the heart and soul of who we are as Seventh-day Adventists. So again, I was very grateful for that opportunity that I had never had before, really, in my life, to dig into the messages of, 18, of the 1880s. Even those teachers at Pacific Union College that were my mentors and the ones I respected so highly, they did not share anything about the message with us as students in the 1960s. It was a buried message. And so um, I became very, very grateful for that opportunity to uh, study this message thoroughly. And believe it or not, it came into full harmony with what I was understanding as the true gospel based on Scripture and the writings of Ellen White. So that was a very, very um, fulfilling period in my life and my ministry. Then I came back to Pacific Union College in the year 1981, and we're going to pick that up next as to what happened during those eventful years from about 1981 to 1985.